This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. So tonight it's my very special uh, privilege to introduce Sandy and Joan Weil. First thing you must know is that Sandy and Joan have been married for 58 years. So bravo for that. Mm -hmm. They have two children and four grandchildren, one of whom is with us tonight. Tommy is with us tonight. As you probably know, Sandy is an internationally renowned banker, financial industry leader, and philanthropist with more than five decades of experience. He retired as CEO of Citicorp in 2003 and served as non-executive chairman until April of 2006. Founded about 200 years ago, Citigroup is currently the third largest bank holding company in the United States by assets and the world's largest financial services network. Sandy's experience and leadership in the financial services industry is legendary. He was chairman and CEO of Travelers, became chairman of its predecessor commercial credit company in 1986, and successfully led the company through a public stock offering by its then parent, Control Data Corporation. Prior to 1986, Sandy had been president of American Express Company and chairman and CEO of its Fireman's Fund Insurance Company subsidiary. In 1993, when Travelers Group acquired Shearson Lehman Brothers, retail brokerage and asset management businesses, he was reunited with the firm he founded. Sandy became director of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in 2001 and served until December of 2006. He also served as a director on the boards of United Technologies Corporation, AT&T Corporation, and DuPont Company. Sandy is former vice chairman of the Business Council and served on the working group on child care. In 1998, Sandy was a recipient of Financial World Magazine's CEO of the Year Award and received the same honor from Ch CEO Magazine in 2002. He's a lifetime member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's also on the Board of Advisors of the Baker Institute of Public Policy at Rice University. While as chairman of the Board of Overseers of Weill Cornell Medical College and Weill Cornell Graduate School of Medical Sciences, having joined the board in 1982 and becoming chair in 1995. While Cornell established the first American Medical School overseas in Qatar in 2001. Sandy was recently elected to prestigious American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's an alumnus and trustee emeritus of Cornell University, as well as the recipient of the school's first Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 1984. Long a proponent of education, Sandy instituted a joint program in the New York City Board of Education in 1980 that created the Academy of Finance, which trains high school students for careers in the financial services sector. And his book, The Real Deal, My Life in Business and Philanthropy, is a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller. Sandy, welcome. And Joan is a tireless supporter of several cultural, philanthropic, and civic endeavors and commits a great deal of her life to public service and to education. Joan joined the board of Alvin Ailey Dance Foundation in 1994 and served as its chairman since 2000. Under her leadership, the board has developed key priorities to help the organization reach its programmatic goals. Joan, along with her husband, has was instrumental in, build, in the building of the Ailey's 
organizational permanent home, which is named in her honor, the Joan Weil Center for Dance. The building completed in 2004 is the largest dedicated to dance in New York City, which is perhaps the dance capital of the world. In addition, Joan is the most recent chair of Paul Smith's College of the Adirondacks, having spearheaded the college's transition from a two-year to a four-year college. Her dedication to women's health issues led her to appointment as co-chair of the New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center's Women's Health Symposium. Joan's personal commitment to public service also extends to many of the activities in which Sandy is involved. And for their combined generosity, Sandy and Joan were recipients of the 2009 Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy Award in recognition of their philanthropic efforts. Joan, welcome to you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds good. <laughs> Well, we now have planned a, a, an informal question and answer period where, where I will ask some questions of Sandy and Joan, and um, uh, we'll explore a broad range of topics, uh, including business and finance. But uh, Sandy and Joan, let, let me start by talking about your, the 58 years of your amazing marriage. So what's, what's been the key to that partnership? She's right. <laughs> <laughs> Always right. <laughs> no. and, a, Go ahead. and a really good sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we've, um, <clears throat> you know, we started, uh, and, I, and I think you can describe our marriage from when we first got married. And I had a job on Wall Street making $150 a month. And Joan, uh, was going to Brooklyn College, but she also was teaching two days a week. And she made more money teaching two days a week than I <laughs> did working five days a week. And Joan, somehow or other, learned something <laughs> about compound interest. And she thinks that I still owe her money. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you all agree? <laughs> <laughs> well, Joan, what, what did your family think of Sandy? I mean, his prospects. Oh, we don't, we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> No, go ahead, tell him. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> <laughs> well, he turned out all right, though. He turned out all right. Finally, finally. <laughs> you know that old saying, behind every successful businessman is a very surprised mother-in-law? That's <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it, it's really amazing uh, to, to see the, the strength of, of your marriage and... Um, Amazing also just to, to see the success, Sandy, that you've had in business, but really the partnership that you and Joan have had in philanthropy. You've, you've really been heroic in giving back, pledging to give back much of your wealth <coughs> to, uh, to causes that you think are important. Well, my wife taught me that she said, always said, shrouds don't have pockets. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> what was my alternative? <laughs> well, that's kind of a gruesome image, but, uh, <laughs> but you, you've, you and Joan have been very generous in, in uh, your commitments to many, many philanthropic uh, causes. You know, we're sort of like steady people, take the long-range approach, so uh, mm -hmm. we've been involved in all the things we do for 20, 30, or more years, and uh, it, we really get an incredible amount of pleasure out of it. And we work with, in every one of our endeavors, we work with really mm -hmm. terrific people. And that, I think, is really the secret. And when you think about the world that we live in today, where our federal government doesn't have much money, our states certainly don't have money, our cities don't have money, counties don't have money, it becomes very important that the private sector and the public sector learn how to work together to accomplish things, and uh, uh, I think it's very, very important that American business understand that uh, it's more than just paying their taxes, but they have smart people that work in the companies, and, and, and the, the people that run these companies should really encourage young people in the, comp in the companies to get involved in, 
in not-for-profits in their local community and help make that community better. And we're going to really have to work together uh, in, in these public-private partnerships to provide what the people in our country really want and deserve. And uh, we got a great private sector, and uh, I think that's going to be key, really, to the future. Mm. How, how do you all think about uh, prioritizing your, your commitments? Is this, um, is this a, a joint discussion that the two of you go through? And, and Usually think? over a chicken dinner, yeah. <laughs> 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 but we do. And, um, you know, you can't... There's so many things that you want to do in this world, but you can't accomplish all of it. So you really need to focus and make a difference. And how passionate are you about each individual thing, which is really very, very important. And, um, you know, there's such a very good sense of, of doing something like that. I mean, you know, it works both ways. You feel good about it, too. And then, of course, we've always been very surprised that we can actually do this. I mean, mm. it didn't start out that way at all. So um, we're very happy to be able to do this. Well, I think one of the most compelling things about the two of you is uh, both grew up in the Bensonhurst area in, in New York City. Uh, um, both went to public schools, at least for part of your education, and, and really fairly modest uh, beginnings. Oh. Um, and so I, it's, it's, it's an inspiration for all of us to see what you all have been able to do with your success and then with your generosity as well. I tell you, it's really a thrill, you know, giving money to institutions that really can use it well mm -hmm. and watch good things happen mm -hmm. and show other people that they can get a good return on their investment if, if they give also. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the reasons we decided to move to California is we uh, wore out our welcome in New York City. <laughs> and, uh, nobody will go to lunch with me anymore. We don't have and, any uh, friends. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, well, we, we hope we, to be we, counted among your new California friends. You certainly are. <laughs> so, Sandy, let's, let's talk about business and finance a little bit. Okay. Um, and let me start out with a question uh, really about leadership and about how you build a team. You've, you've said that you've never been afraid to hire people who are smarter than you. So tell us a little bit about your philosophy of uh, building partnerships with colleagues and, and hiring the right people in your, your companies? <clears throat> well, basically, I think my and our philosophy was that uh, a company should be like a family. We uh, believed in including spouses or significant others as, as part of what was going on. Uh, with the theory that we, we worked in a stressful business and uh, the person that worked in this business lots of times would come home at night uh, in not too good a mood. And if the partner or spouse knew what that person was going through and understood the business, they'd be able to be much more helpful. And <clears throat> from a selfish point of view, from the company's point of view, um, the company was much better off to have two supporters in the household rather than one and the other one not knowing what's going on. So that, that I think, was always a very important thing, and uh, we always try to encourage people that uh, they shouldn't be afraid of hiring people smarter than they are. Uh, I remember uh, when I, uh, we hired Bob Rubin, who was certainly smarter than I was uh, in some ways, um, and uh, we had very different philosophies about things, and I used to love talking to him about what I was thinking of doing and getting his thoughts which were very different than mine, and it would get me to think through an issue much more clearly and, and thoughtfully before we ended up doing it without really delaying a decision process. And uh, I think that we like to feel that uh, the enemy was not the person in the next office, but it was the person across the street, and that we all really have to work together, and communication is important. And <clears throat> I ran a business with 250,000 employees in, uh, in 102 countries. And believe it or not, I don't know how to use a computer. I never had a BlackBerry. I didn't send any emails because I didn't know how. Uh, and I 
barely knew how to use a cell phone. But I managed by walking around, meeting thousands and thousands of people, uh, really getting to understand what was going on in the business where they met the clients, and not just relying on seven or eight people that are telling me what they want me to hear, or not telling me about issues that were popping up uh, because they weren't ready to understand them yet. Uh, and you know, I think we really believed in full and open commu communication. We uh, used our auditors and our regulators. We felt uh, uh, of them as uh, they're there to serve us. I mean, we pay their fees. We, through taxes, we pay for the 60 or 70 people that used to be in our office uh, every day from the uh, Treasury Department. And why not use these people? So uh, when I'd get nervous about markets or something, I'd sit down with the person that was in charge of our account and ask him, tell me things I should be nervous about. You know, where do you see real excesses happening? And I'd go down to our bond department or some of our bankers and scare the hell out of them. And uh, I think it saved us a lot of problems. And uh, you know, so I, I think a lot of a lot of management and a lot of leadership is uh, about listening to people, and uh, it's about common sense. And uh, I think if I could do it, anybody could do it. <laughs> and we built a company. This my second career was uh, started in uh, uh, 1986 with a little company called Commercial Credit uh, that <clears throat> was part of a computer company that never made a profit, and we took that public and raised enough additional money that uh, the rating agencies gave us uh, a marginal uh, uh, <coughs> uh, rating of like a triple B, so we were able to access uh, the capital markets a little bit because that was our product. And uh, that company grew from, in its first year, making several hundred thousand dollars to uh, uh, the year I retired, making 19 billion after taxes, which uh, is not a bad number. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, someday they get back there. Mm -hmm. So, Sandy, um, you've you've made some very interesting uh, comments about the evolution of your thinking about separation of uh, banking and insurance companies, and uh, <laughs> this is something that we like you to, to, to share a little bit about in terms of how your thinking has uh, evolved over the years. And uh, you made comments about maybe some of the financial institutions now are really too big and maybe should be uh, broken up. But on the other hand, uh, you were a staunch supporter of the repeal of Glass-Steagall. So tell us a little bit about how you've, how you've evolved in your thinking about this very important topic. Uh, <clears throat> Well, let me first say that uh, you know I think the United States uh, bore a lot of responsibility for some of the financial problems that not didn't just happen in the United States, but were also interconnected. It reverberated around the world. We also um, uh, had a policy of uh, everybody should uh, run their country with our style of democracy. And if you didn't, we didn't like you very much. That was not a very good idea either. Uh, and yet, with all the problems, no other country has surfaced as a country that's able to be a leader uh, in this new world of ours as we hopefully continue to grow and hopefully uh, can get uh, two billion more people that now still live in abject poverty into de, uh, something defined as a middle class in, in their particular countries, because if we don't do that, uh, they're going to blow this place up. So uh, <clears throat> since we still have that opportunity to be a leader, and I think we can do it better than any other country in the world, uh, I think it's very important that we have a strong <coughs> financial business. And uh, beyond, going beyond the fact that uh, uh, our a lot of people and our government doesn't appear to uh, like financial companies, doesn't trust financial companies, hates uh, 
financial CEOs uh, really not making it uh, a very attractive place for young people like yourself to want to go in that business because who the heck wants to be shot at all the time and, and uh, looked at funny. But much beyond that, we've created an environment, and this is what I think the real problem is, we've created an environment that it is not a good thing to make a mistake, that if you are a bank and you have the backing of our treasury and risking taxpayer dollars and risking uh, consumers' deposits, you, you are not really allowed to make a mistake. So, and if people aren't allowed to make a mistake, they aren't going to do many good things. So <clears throat> I think we've, we've strangled the financial business without really coming up with real facts as to how they should be managed, which really could be pretty simple and not in a 900-page document a very small print like Dodd-Frank that doesn't even get to the issues yet or the Volcker rule that nobody knows what that means yet. And this is three years after it happened. Um, I think just simply, because uh, I don't want to get into too complicated, but we can do it on, on one page if we limited the leverage that a financial institution could have to something like 15 times risk-weighted assets, risk-rated assets, versus 30 or 40 times plus, uh, plus that they had in, in the time when the markets all crashed, we would be limiting the kind of risk that a bank can take. Second, if the banks had a, have complete visibility to everything that they were doing, and that there'd be no such thing as off balance sheet, that if you wanted to do something and, and you wanted to take a position, it should be exposed to the clear light of day and beyond the balance sheet. So this whole business about special purpose vehicles and, and uh, other things off the balance sheet, which increased the leverage by about 50% for some of these institutions that ended up going broke, shouldn't be allowed at all. And third, uh, as it relates to derivatives, and this I understand the least, but I think there should be an exchange where these derivatives are traded, that they should be marked to market every day, so that uh, you're not letting uh, the creditworthiness or, uh, or any other thing that affects how that position is related and what the counterparty uh, can do or not do uh, so that you don't get a snowballing effect from what happens in some of these derivative trades. And that also, it appears on your balance sheet, so you have to have the capital against it as you mark this to market every day. I think you can you know, have a pretty good control over the financial institutions. <clears throat> but I do not believe that, uh, uh, that we're going to allow... Um, uh, the institutions to really take the kinds of risks that they really should take. And we've saw, we saw before Glass-Steagall went away that uh, companies like uh, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, without having deposits and without being a bank, was able to compete with, uh, with our company in making loans to companies and being very competitive in how they competed for investment banking business. I, I don't think that the investment banking and trading part of a business has to be part of a bank. So to, to basically to ensure the fact that we can continue to work in countries around the world in the development of capital markets uh, and the access to capital and, and the public offerings of companies and, and their having access to capital so these economies and countries can grow, I think that it can happen much better if the, the trading and investment banking part of these institutions uh, get out from under the deposit taking and the, and the backing of the federal government. And with the leverages that I talked about, any one of these companies can go broke without causing a run on everybody else. It just wouldn't be that leverage the system. So that's what, uh, I mean, I, I'm just thinking about uh, not 
whether it makes um, it creates more shareholder value, which I think it might, uh, because of how people feel. But I think it's important for the U.S. to stay a leader in uh, in the in the financial industry, which I think is really at the center of. Uh, what helps create the growth in uh, these economies around the world of which they're all interrelated. I'm, I'm fascinated with your idea of, uh, of a one-page document with a handful of principles that you just outlined as, as compared to Dodd-Frank, which has 800-plus pages. H have you had a chance to propose your one-page document to any policymakers? And if you have, what's been the reaction? Hmm. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I have strange friends. <laughs> uh, right. I think that there is, uh, you know, I was very surprised when I made this statement on uh, uh, <clears throat> on television on CNBC, CNBC. and uh, and it really uh, seems like it has legs. It continues to have legs. Mm -hmm. It's being discussed a lot in a lot of the European uh, mm -hmm. uh, countries. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think it's something that should be thought about mm -hmm. um, because, you know, when you talk about public-private partnerships and you talk about businesses, uh, you know, people did things wrong. You know, some of them have been punished. Maybe some of them haven't, but it's too late for that. Mm -hmm. We should get on with our lives mm -hmm. and, and be positive and... and, and figure out how to get our governments to come together in, in, in Washington and uh, not create all this uncertainty, which mm -hmm. I think is the major reason right. our economy is not doing much better than it is and why a major reason why we're not hiring uh, more people than we're hiring, why the recovery has been uh, so slow. And uh, if this is a way that, that can help that happen, uh, and do away with the negatives and then, you know, start talking about, you know, we're all Americans working together to help make this world a better place because uh, it's the only world we know. Uh, uh, I think that's a good thing. So that's a great transition into my next question, and that is to mm. ask you to look into the future a little bit uh, for us in the future of the financial market. So there's been an, an, an extraordinary uh, strengthening recently, say in the past mm -hmm. year, of mm -hmm. uh, the financial market. So the Dow is at uh, near all-time highs, around 14,000. Mm -hmm. uh, S&P is You been didn't up. look today. No, I'm, <laughs> you hadn't let me finish my comment. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Dow is, or the S&P is up 12% 12, 12 for the year so far. Um, but okay. I checked it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> In the last 52 weeks. Oh, 52 weeks. 52 weeks. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I thought the year was two months old. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. 52 <laughs> weeks. Okay. 52 weeks. Okay. But, but today the, dro the Dow drops 215 points. Mm -hmm. So what, what do we make of these, the, of these movements? Are, are we in an, a, a generally upward mm -hmm. trajectory, or are we in for more of a boom and bust cycle? <coughs> so what are your thoughts? I think the United States basically is in a very, very good position. The consumer has been paying down a lot of its debt. Uh, the housing market appears to have bottomed and it is firming in lots of parts of this country. We've become very competitive again uh, with uh, a lot of countries in the manufacturing businesses uh, where uh, our our industries are, are doing well, and we can compete with a lot of the Asian countries. We certainly can more than compete with Europe. We can uh, uh, compete with uh, Mexico, and, and you know our automobile industry is growing. Foreign automobile companies are building plants in the United States. We we have uh, great positions in in um, you know the earth moving businesses, companies like Caterpillar and Cummings uh, Engine and uh, a really terrific manufacturing icons, Boeing, uh, wants to get those batteries working again. <laughs> um, the problem with uh, farming out all of the pr all of the mm. production of this airplane, but uh, it's a great company, United Technologies. Uh, we have great science in this country. You live in a state where all these young people are coming up with these incredible ideas and. Uh, and some of them are even moving to San Francisco, and the, the place is booming. I mean, it's, it's a great country. 
What are some of the other obstacles you see uh, to further economic prosperity in terms of, uh, what are we facing in terms of pensions? What are we facing in terms of the changing demographic of the workforce? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think we've done this uh, zero um, interest rate stuff for, personally for long enough. Uh, we've floated unbelievable amounts of money into the, the market, and I worry while there's no sign of any kind of inflation now, uh, usually things like this do create some problems down the road, and, and uh, this, this um, encouraging the market by artificially low rates is not just happening in the United States, mm -hmm. but it's happening in, in all over Europe, and it's happening uh, in other parts of the world also. Uh, and it's a very tough thing uh, for pension funds uh, and for retired people like Joan and I. I mean, it's not fair. Uh, I don't think you're really retired, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, 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 I think that the interest rate scenario that the Fed is doing is encouraging people that don't know better to take risk, uh, more risk than they know they're taking, whether that risk is in duration or the risk is in the credit side. That people are taking more risk to try and get that little bit more money that they need rather than z the zero. You know, uh, if you look, and I, I, I never would have believed that uh, the Treasury bill would sell at 80 basis points, a five-year Treasury bill. I mean, it's, 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 not a, it's not a great thing, and we don't need rates to be as low as it is. It, we should let the market uh, take it. I don't, I don't know what uh, you think, but uh, it we'll, doesn't make your life easier. We'll have her in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One moment. So let, let me switch back uh, for a moment now to the partnership that, that you and Joan have had. And I'm particularly interested in... You think it's over? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good. I wonder if you knew something I didn't. <laughs> Just a small detour back. <laughs> I'm, I'm fa fascinated with uh, your support of the Wa Cornell Medical School, in particular the medical school in Doha, Qatar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still the only U.S. U institution to offer an MD degree outside the U.S., and you've been going now for 11 years. <laughs> Why did you select the Middle East as a location for that branch campus? Well, <clears throat> uh, they were talking to the University of Virginia uh, Medical School, <clears throat> and I think that Virginia decided not to go ahead with it. Um, I think that uh, there was a thought process, and in some places still exists, uh, a thought process that... Um, my school, this is from boards of trustees, shouldn't do anything in any Arab country mm -hmm. until there's peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cornell was not that much different. Um, but I think I and some others looked at it uh, that, you know, there are a billion and a half Muslims in this world and we better learn how to get along with them. There's a lot of people. And you get along with them by working together, by bridging the cultural divides, and that can happen through education, and that can happen through music, and, uh, uh, and in, in negotiating with the people from Qatar. Uh, and uh, this is really the emir's wife uh, who has come up with this. They uh, agreed, and it took a, it was about a year of negotiation, but they agreed to every one of the governance issues that we believe was important to a school like Cornell University and Weill Cornell. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a big thing for them to give on co-ed classes. They didn't have that before. Uh, blind admission, people got admitted based on uh, their abilities. Uh, no favoritism to royal families. Um, that. Uh, they had to have the same MCAT scores to get into our branch in Qatar as, they, as they, our students in New York. And from day one, they've done as well. 
as our students in New York, and the great percentage of them have ended up going uh, doing their residencies in the United States, although I think they'll all, most of them will all go back to the region because they're now building uh, an intellectual uh, group of people mm. in, in that part of the world so that uh, there are people to talk to, there are, there's research growing, there's uh, all kinds of things in this country, uh, they, uh, this country cutter, uh, has a budget that's based on oil being at X dollars. And anything above that goes into education, healthcare, and research. And that's a pretty terrific thing, rather than what happened 20 years ago, where it went into uh, palaces, airplanes, mm -hmm. boats, uh, you know. And while we're watching NIH grants go down in the United States, what they're spending on research is going up, and uh, so it's much more than making up uh, the research that with the, with the dollars that we may not get in the U.S. We're getting mm -hmm. over there, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it's I think a terrific thing that uh, that we did. So uh, I was there last week, and then uh, <clears throat> I went to Turkey, and uh, you know, and Turkey is another example of the stupidity I think uh, uh, like on the part of the French. Um, where they say that uh, you know Turkey is a moderate Muslim country, 75 million people. Economically, it's a it's a it's a religious government, but they govern secularly, sort mm -hmm. of. Uh, and uh, the GDP per capita in Turkey has grown in the last 10 years. That this country, this party has been in power from $2,400 a person to close to $14,000 a person. That's pretty good, and they didn't have any problem, really, in this downturn of any great consequence. And France says, you know, we'll allow Turkey to come in maybe over the next 10 years of talking, mm -hmm. but only as a second-class uh, member without any vote. Well, mm -hmm. that doesn't send a very good message no. to uh, a lot of other places that aren't as moder moderate. Exactly. So, uh, so anyway, we, we got invited to go to a place I'd never been before, uh, called Baku, which is in Azerbaijan, uh, nine million people, uh, and they want to build a hospital, <clears throat> and uh, they want our help, maybe. So, uh, because of what we did in, in the other place, so we'll see. They got a lot of oil, <laughs> and a lot, and a lot, and and they've given a lot of their money to the World Bank to manage, like a lot. So that they're not really just throwing it away, and it's not, mm. it's not all corruption. Mm. Good, Joan. What what have you felt were the most compelling outcomes or impacts of the program in Qatar? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I I was very impressed with that it was taught in English, mm. and that I think it was sixty percent of the students were women, mm. and. Um, and I was very impressed with this, because you know, I asked them, each woman, each person individually, why are you doing this? Why did you want to become a doctor? And the stories were really sad, but beautiful. Um, one of them had seen so much destruction in their country. Um, you know, they wanted to save lives, they, they, and they all wanted to go back to their own countries, which um, was very impressive for me. And, 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 you know, to see a group of young people coming from all over the world and working together and helping each other and going to the cafeteria together and, and just working, it shows you what can happen in this world. And these are people. people from different faithths, from different oh, yeah. countries, obviously mostly, different most ethnicities. Of them, most of them are Muslim. Uh, but but different mm -hmm. countries from... Um, as far away as Bangladesh and Bosnia and... Uh, and and in fact, there was an American, too. Mm -hmm. American girl, mm -hmm. French. But there were, there were a couple of boys <laughs> from Iraq. <clears throat> and then they come to the United States in their, in their third year in to do research in, in New York with our people and see right. how, how we're, we're doing that. Mm -hmm. But boy, oh boy, to get some of these people, uh, green cards into the United States when 
a uh, guy's name is Osama. Well, we don't like Osamas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, this is a different Osama. Uh, I mean, yeah, especially uh, especially God. that Osama who <laughs> went to a paint, uh, what do you call that, paint? Paintball. Paintball. Uh, paint guns. Paint guns. Um, yeah. <laughs> that didn't help That was not smart. <laughs> <laughs> but we ended up, you know, or uh, they come from... Uh, you know, Iraq and Syria and, uh, you know, all the places that they come from. And, uh, well, yeah, but uh, we have Mike Conway who gets them all, visas. <laughs> yeah. Well, what so. a great uh, boundary spanning. Mm -hmm. And then, then, then we had another thing, uh, which is with a country that doesn't have any money, uh, but um, there uh, is a Catholic priest who, before he became a priest, was a graduate of our medical school. And he was a missionary in Tanzania. And uh, they had the beginning of a fledgling sort of an education program, and we were giving them some older equipment and books and stuff like that. And he came and, and talked to us, and we went down there, and uh, uh, we have sort of this partnership with the Catholic Church and, and the government of Tanzania where they had like one doctor for every 34,000 people. Mm. And this is in a town called Wanza, which is the second biggest city in Tanzania on the, the mouth of the of Lake Victoria. Uh, and now it's like six, seven years later, we're graduating 100 doctors a year. We have our residents from New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell going down to, we're getting better residents because they can participate and go down to Tanzania to do a month or, or six weeks of residency. And they come back understanding why they right. went into medicine and you know because there's no such thing as MRIs you know you, a blood test means nothing because you know have no idea whose blood you're going to get back and uh, uh, and a lot of these people I mean uh, they can have like malaria and TB and AIDS all in the same body I mean it's mm. It's it's terrible, and uh, you know, and you have these medicine men, and and the the average life expectancy in the country is like 42 years, mainly because uh, there's no education about childbirth, and and nothing much about early childhood diseases, and uh, so the, the, we're going to make a big difference in, in that. There, it's sounds like it's, it's having great. a great impact. It, it is. Yeah. It is. But it needs to be much more. Mm. It's really yeah. devastating. So, so let's let's return to uh, business and leadership, and in particular, I want to talk about. Uh, this is business. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it's medicine and philanthropy. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to return to this uh, a topic that's that's involved in business and leadership, and that's uh, corporate governance, and. Um, I'd like to in, invite our, our good friend and, and colleague from CalPERS, Ann Simpson, to, to join us in this conversation. Ann is the Senior Portfolio Manager and Director of Corporate Governance in the Investment Office of the California Public Employees Retirement System, better known as CalPERS. So as many of us know, because of course CalPERS is headquartered in Sacramento, this is the largest pension fund in the U.S. It has about $250 billion under management. And uh, very interestingly, Ann oversees the corporate governance program at CalPERS. And she has thought deeply about corporate governance, boards of directors, and so on. And uh, we'd like to invite her to, mm -hmm. to join us now to mm -hmm. participate in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So, Ann. <laughs> and I just want to tell you, I yes, used to sir. be scared as hell of your company. Oh, good. Stay that <laughs> way. <laughs> it's good to be uh, a little, a little intimidating. That's fine. A because would it's, be okay. No, no, because it's all, because it's all in a good cause. Um, but I, I first of all wanted to say how much I'd enjoyed meeting Sandy and Joan at dinner Thank because you, I think mutual. we count ourselves as part of the immigrant community <laughs> in <laughs> California. I'm a genuine alien <laughs> uh, and they're both from New York. So, I mean, you know, really, this is a wonderful thing, isn't it? California is attracting people from all over the place. But um, I, I suppose I was very, I was very touched by um, the stories that both of you were telling. And, and when I came from only 6,000 miles away. <laughs> there, were, there were two things that I remember vividly in my first weeks um, as a new person at CalPERS, which, remember, 
Um, when I arrived, it was the middle of 2009. Um, yeah, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, about nine months previously, when CalPERS first, you know, rang on the bell and asked me to come and uh, maybe join them, the, uh, the, the fund was at about the value it is today, Stephen, your 254, 55 billion. By the time I arrived nine months later, it had lost $70 billion. The financial system, I mean, well. what's, what's <laughs> going to make it long term? And what's going to make, because at the moment you're talking about philanthropy and you're talking about business as though they're different things. How are we going to bring it together? Well, That's we have my to, question. Well, that I agree with you. Yeah. We, have to, we have to bring it together. And um, I think that there are always going to be greedy people. There are, you know, if you go through a good period in the economy, and we went through a pretty long good period from 82 to a little over 2000 mm. uh, in, in the U.S. economy, uh, you know, people, it breeds greed, it breeds some mistakes. It, in this case, it, breeded, it bred a lot of mistakes. But I, yeah. I can only tell you from our own company, AI, yeah. I, I, I believe in a shareholder and shareholder value. Uh, I believe that there's no long term without the short term. But every one of our managers were compensated on the basis of long term. And let me tell you how we did it. And nobody else does it uh, uh. sort of the way we, we used to. But our 35 top managers, who are the people that really make the big decisions in the company, uh. could not sell any of their stock that they owned in the company until they retired. Right. The only thing they could do is they were able to give away, over a period of time, up to 25% of what they held to charity. Hmm. Which is, and uh, that tied them in, so none of them were going to make money because this quarter was good, right. because they couldn't sell their stock. And if they were making this quarter good at the expense of the future, mm -hmm. they, they, it wasn't going to work. Hmm. So we were tying in, getting them interested in in philanthropy mm. and benefiting. And uh, you know, our stock, I think, went up something like 2,700% in 17 years, better than uh, Bo Warren Buffett mm -hmm. and, and General That Electric. still upsets him. Pardon me? That still upsets him. That's good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps telling you. <laughs> um, so what do you think we do to get this long-term approach? I mean, the theme we, we have at CalPERS, I mean, it's interesting, because, because we're a pension fund. And uh, so we have a fiduciary duty. Mm -hmm. um, we've got 1.6 million members, as Stephen said. Um, but if you shut the doors tomorrow, we probably still have to be paying pensions for the best part of a century. Mm -hmm. So the long term that we're looking to, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. terms of all of these risks mm -hmm. and systems mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, issues of poverty, right. mm -hmm. water stress, climate, we're trying to work out with this framework of sustainability what is it that really matters? So if you were going to be mm -hmm. king of Wall Street for the day and get everyone's attention, I and do. we were thinking about the next century and the last CalPERS pensioner, what, what would you be your advice? What should we be paying attention to? Value, mm -hmm. which changes. You know, uh, you, you can go look back 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Uh, and we had the nifty 50 and we had all these different things and a lot of those companies aren't in business anymore yeah. you know the names like eastman kodak where mm. is that mm. and there are lots of examples like that so i think your job is to make sure that you stay on top of what's happening you know if uh, a company didn't care about shareholders what's going to happen to the value of your pension how are you going to honor all those mm. obligations mm. I think something we're very aware of, though, is that you know, shareholders are a very diverse group, mm -hmm. and you know, when I, w I was here um, to, to speak at one of the dean's events, I said, we don't have shareholders anymore. You have three groups: the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. We've got owners like Calpers. We hold the shares for a long term. We worry about how the company's doing for the long term. We want mm -hmm. underlying growth. Then you've got the traders. Think about the high frequency traders and the algorithms. That's driving 60% of turnover in the market now. Mm -hmm. What kind of ownership is that? And then you have the raiders, the pirates, those who jump on board and 
sort of bully companies into disgorging cash or, you know, sometimes these things need mm -hmm. to be done. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's a you shock to the system. You can never bully a good company. Well, there are weak companies. There are vulnerable companies. And uh, a lot of you the leverage... You shouldn't own vulnerable companies. Sorry? You shouldn't own... We, we're too big. We own everything. And anyway, you know, the problem <laughs> child is... <laughs> And also the problem child we is always split the you one. Up. <laughs> Absolutely not. Get that on the record. No. <laughs> too big to manage or too big to fail. Right. Right. <laughs> no, we're the big mama pension right, fund. Sure Think of us that way. Right. We need to look after a lot of people. But and also the, the companies of interest to me are the ones that are struggling but have the potential. Mm. That's where we spend most of our time with, you mm -hmm. know, conversations with companies. Um, you know, an, in, an involvement. But to talk to me about hedge funds. What do we do about robo traders? What do we do about high frequency trading? What do we do about hedge funds? And does this make the markets a more dangerous mm -hmm, place mm -hmm, or just a mm -hmm. more exciting place for companies? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. IPOs have died. I mean, companies IPO, are not coming I, to market. IPOs aren't dying. I, I think we're seeing some of them, more of them happen. Mm -hmm. especially in technology. We're seeing a lot of M&A activity all of a sudden and companies being bought, uh, which shows, I think, some health in, in mm -hmm. the market. Uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with, uh, necessarily with hedge funds. I'm not, I'm not sure I think that there's any real value in uh, Robo traders or people that are in and out of the market in seconds and mm. and that kind of thing or uh, um, the algorithms I don't understand. Uh, it's the rhythm. Mm -hmm. You've got to get the yeah. rhythm. And I don't have good will. rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> I promise to dance with you, but I don't have good rhythm. <laughs> but, I don't uh, know. I have to turn to a no right. problem. No. <laughs> uh, but don't you, explain. But you know this this is a free country. Mm. Uh, and we have we have free expression, uh, which goes to what people can say about how somebody is running a company, or and, and you know Calpers is entitled to their position, which uh, I think serves a good use useful purpose. And uh, somebody that uh, has a hedge fund, uh, uh, that money is coming from people that are investing with him. Okay. I bet you have a lot of money in hedge funds. 2% of the portfolio. Not a lot. Is that a lot? No, not a lot. No. No. For good reason. But yeah, okay, good. Mm. I don't have any money in hedge funds either. <laughs> <laughs> I think they charge oh, too dear. much. <laughs> 2 and 20? <laughs> yeah, right. It's like spread the love, hey? <laughs> right, yeah. Share the, share the spoils. Right. So if you had a piece of advice for Congress other than do a deal, if you were to look at all of Dodd Frank, I, I loved your comment that Dodd Frank is. 2,300 pages, and we should distill it to one mm -hmm. page, because famously Winston Churchill, great wartime leader, um, used to, two things I remember about the stories we were taught at school about the war. One was that he drank a bottle of brandy a day. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why it seemed not? to work. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, obviously wasn't rationed. I don't know yeah, how right. he got a hold of it, but anyway. One was that he drank a bottle of brandy a day. And the second was that he refused to read anything longer than one page. Mm. So famously, mm -hmm. the state of the British Navy. Mm -hmm. And whoever was thinking how to distill it actually had to get the main ideas. Mm -hmm. So it's what would be... A great yeah, idea. So Winston Churchill on Dodd-Frank. What, mm -hmm. what, what would the essentials be? the unmissable mm -hmm. pieces mm -hmm. of advice. He would say what you told me at dinner, right? Tell me. He, w he would say that uh, this may not be the best system, but I don't know a better one. Or or what, what, you said it better. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you it's, said what it's he actually, said. I said what he said. So he said democracy is the worst form of government right. other than the alternatives. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So yeah, the least, the least worst. But, you know, I think freedom of expression is a good thing in markets. And, uh, mm. and uh, I, I think that our system has worked, uh, like Churchill said, better than any other that we've seen. Right, right. It certainly works better than the systems that the Europeans have put forward, yeah. which have made them very uncompetitive. You know, Germany has become very strong because they're selling their product as if their currency was a lira. Mm -hmm. The euro? Yeah. Is like the lira. 
Well, it's, yeah, it's a good part, Lira. And, and the Deutsche, the Bundesbank, it's is the, behind the Lira. Yeah, now, yeah, steady yeah. on. I know yeah. you're a banker, but this is... <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, anyway. I think Sandy already, I mean, going back to something he said earlier, he, he listed three or four things about transparency, about uh, market clearing and derivatives. Uh, there were several things that you said earlier, mm -hmm. Sandy, that right. I think mm. answer uh, Anne's question. What would go on that one page? Well, we, we uh, have a yeah. one page mm -hmm. because when we go in to talk to the SEC or to politicians, I've just been, you know, made my first tour of duty in Congress where we sit down and the attention span of a politician's chief of staff is, it's already gone. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> it's over. Right. So the one page, I think, is actually down to almost a tweet. Mm -hmm. You need a tweet <laughs> on what will fix the commercial market, you know, the mm -hmm. capital mm -hmm. markets. Mm -hmm. We're almost at the 140 characters. So, so ours is very much, I think, I think we're very much on the same, same, on the same one page as you, as you are, Sandy. Which, now we got to put the same thing on that one page. Well, <laughs> that might get a, right. you say tomato, uh, I say, say tomato. tomato. Why don't the two of you try to write the one page? Should we do that? Yeah. All do that. right. We'll do it There's as a, a challenge. Listen, we'll do it as a duet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you think we that would try. work? Well, we, we could try. By golly, that's something. going to be on CNBC. I would, that would be on CNBC. I would, I would go along with tomato and tomato. <laughs> yeah, but you have to and say tomato, and deal. I have to say right. tomato to right. show we're global citizens. Exactly. Very good. Exactly. Pomodoro that's a deal. to your lira. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or the peseta. <laughs> oh, well, that true. <laughs> Shall we invite some uh, yeah. questions from from the audience, please? Yes, could you please use the microphone? We've got microphones on either side. Well, maybe the, oh. Ken is gonna help us with the. That's good. Wonderful. It should be on. I maybe just try speaking into it before you. Uh, thank you. Um, no. Um, Welcome to UC Davis. Thank I've you. been living in Davis for almost 50 years, and uh, it's really a pleasure to welcome Joan and Sandy to, Thank to you. UC Davis. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I have really followed your career for 40 years, Sandy. Golly. And now I know why you're so successful, and also having a career that's also meaningful, not only successful, because you have Joan right there. Oh, very thank, you. Very thank, you. Very thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Very nice. I was very impressed when you said that when you were running a business, as a part of your leadership, is to go around ask people mm. for opinions that perhaps is contrary to what you believe. That opens mm -hmm. your mind and raises your consciousness of where the risks are hiding mm -hmm. or what should be done. Mm -hmm. Okay. So today I would like to play that role. Okay. Uh, yes, as a former regulator, I love to have a regulation only on one page, or at most <laughs> three pages. But Very however, nice. the reality is quite different. I remember just last June, I was at a dinner meeting where Paul Volcker was at a table. And a question was posed to Paul Volcker. Why the heck that a Volk, Paul Volcker role should take more than three or 400 pages? Mm. Why? And he gave a very simple answer. Don't ask me, ask the lobbyists. <laughs> he said, no. my vocal role is very clear. At most, maybe you want to really go to extreme. It's 30 pages, should I say, really mm. choosing. But the lobbyists by the financial services industry are so successful. They come up with nitpick here and nitpick there. And then, of course, the regulators will have to write rules about how these things apply mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and go on and on and on. So my question, number one, is posed to you as a leader in the financial services industry. No more. What, well, you still are, okay? Whether you like it or not, you still are, <laughs> okay? You're not retired. Thank you. Uh, how would you deal with this situation where the millions of dollars spent by the financial services industry to lobby such to make the rule interpretations, exceptions, loopholes, so complicated. That's number mm -hmm. one. The second question I, uh, I want to ask you is this. Um, people always complain about the, uh, the rules make the cost of doing business so unacceptable and the poor consumers are going to pay for it. You know, you want the higher capital ratios, 
uh, mock to market and Basel III and all of that, on and on mm -hmm. and on, mm -hmm. raising the cost. But what is your definition of cost of doing business? Is the out-of-pocket cost of the banks or you want to factor in the damage to the entire economy, millions of people losing their jobs, or even the poor village in the northern part of Nor uh, Norway lost money because they bought some of those subprime-backed mortgage-backed mm -hmm. securities. Don't forget the bankers in Iceland. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so therefore, how would you, from your experience, how would you define cost for the bankers when they talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the regulations made them higher cost? And then finally, <laughs> finally. Maybe you should let him answer one yeah. before he's yeah. going. I, I just want to say what lessons that you think regulators should learn in this financial fiasco that mm -hmm. caused millions of people lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love the first part of what you said. I think you should. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let, let me try and answer the question. Uh, if I think what has to happen is we have to figure out how can we have intelligent regulation without lobbyists from all sides? How can we get Congress to understand what they're talking about and what they're writing things about and these things that get written in the middle of the night that nobody knows what's in, in the laws that they pass? Uh, I think if you can figure out a way to to do that, that would be a terrific thing because it, it creates all kinds of problems. I mean, nobody knew what was in uh, the new health care law. It's still being written as we sit here. That's a hard way to run any kind of business. So, uh, uh, and and I, I'm always amazed at the lack of understanding uh, of some of these people that have very important positions in committees in Congress. So uh, if there's a better way than lobbyists, if they would listen, but as you said, you know, their span of attention is like zero. It's very, it's, it's very difficult. So I, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I, think regu I think good regulators are terrific. And, you know, I, I was in the securities business for most of my life, and the regulator was the SEC, who in my mind is a terrible regulator because they didn't stop problems from happening. They always came after issues after the fact, and they always declared victory against people that were already dead. <laughs> Whereas I, I, I thought when I became a, a banker, uh, I thought the OCC was a phenomenal regulator of how you were running your business. Um, and I thought that the Fed was as good as they could be with the knowledge that they had because they only regulated a small part of the markets. They had nothing to do at that point in time with hedge funds or investment banks, but they, they did a pretty good job on, the, on that part of it. Uh, I think, I don't know what changed afterwards, but obviously a lot did that created, uh, you know, all kinds of catastrophes. But I think, as I said before, I think we have to get past the blame game and how do we build a, a, a functional financial system that's going to be able to accomplish uh, what we want it to accomplish and help make uh, keep the United States as the leader of uh, the free world that can help uh, encourage the development of economies in, in all these uh, uh, countries around the world so that the, the people that are in abject poverty see that they can have a future. Good, very good. Uh, other questions? But thank you. Hmm. Other questions? And uh, mm -hmm. by the way, if, you, if you're a member of the media, could you please identify yourself? Uh, I know Steve Fleming is not. Not so. a member of the media, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, thanks, uh, thanks Steve. Uh, Sandy, I'd like to get your perspective on the 2008 period where we had this collapse of a large number of very large financial institutions and the, the decisions by the Fed and the Treasury and the FDIC were somewhat uneven through that period. And I'd like to get your, your thoughts on how you, you assess what, what sort of scorecard you give them for their, mm -hmm. their involvement. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I, I think we were in, in my mind, a very, very dangerous period in, in 2008 that, uh, uh, you know, when markets seize up, you, you know, companies that could have been very good and strong uh, the day before could be out of business the next day. And uh, I would hate to think what would have happened to this country had not the Fed and the Treasury come together with the program that they did to, uh, to bail out the banks. Uh, and uh, I just thank God to, to those people every, every single day. And if you look at what happened, you know, all of the money that was lent to the banks was paid back with profits. Uh, they even, AIG even paid back which I think is amazing, what they had borrowed with a profit to the Treasury. The losses are General Motors, which last time I looked was not a bank, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which was encouraged to do things and go into the subprime business uh, that paid no attention to the fact that uh, you know, a lot of what was being done by uh, mortgage brokers and filling out these forms were completely false, and, uh, and that everybody should not only own one home in America, which used to be the dream when I was growing up, but have two or three, because, you know, if one's good, you know, maybe you can make some money on the second or the third. Um, so I, that's what I think about, uh, it was really, really scary. And, you know, I saw this once before, and this is not the first time it happened. In 1990, uh, our company then was still called Commercial Credit, and we were doing very well, I thought. Uh, but Citibank got in problems with real estate, and Manny Haney had some problems, and all of a sudden the commercial paper market looked like it was going to uh, seize up, and, uh, and uh, there were rumors that we wouldn't roll over, be able to roll over our commercial paper, which is how we financed our business. And rumors can become facts. You know, with, with the people talking, and it was really, really scary. And my wife dragged me up to the Adirondacks, to, uh, which I thought was Appalachia. And uh, <laughs> uh, but we went up for a weekend, and I took a seven and a half mile walk through the woods. And at the end of that walk, I didn't give a damn about commercial paper. <laughs> but you know, th these things happen from time to time in financial markets. They're always panics. There are excesses, unfortunately. This one was a very bad one. And a lot of people got hurt. A lot of people, including yours truly. Yeah. Frank? Um. Uh, I'm curious to find out what you think about the role of technology in banking. I'm specifically referring to, I guess, what might be described as the unbanked or the underbanked, <clears throat> or um, let's just say um, the companies that are uh, come under the rubric of the shadow banking arena who, using technology, are able to find less labor-intensive ways and more creative ways to serve those various categories of um, consumers. What part do you think that'll play in um, what I'll call the financial services arena, which obviously is larger than banking per se, going well, forward? It's much larger, but I don't quite understand your question. I, I think that the desire of all companies should be to have the least expense in in delivering the product to the consumer. That's how the consumer is going to end up getting v better value, and the company is going to have more money to reinvest for the future. So uh, some of them just aren't adept enough or equipped to be able to do that. So for example, well, then they shouldn't be in business. So then they, that you're suggesting that, for example, a, a technology-oriented company in Silicon Valley that comes up with a way of banking you know, people that currently aren't banked could supersede uh, what is called a bank today in terms of providing a better service. As long as they go by the banking rules. I mean, if they're going to be lending money and collecting deposits so that they have the money to lend, because they got to get it someplace, then they're going to have to follow the rules of the banks. So does that mean they have to have a charter to do that? I, I would say probably yes. 
Yeah. But, but it's not a problem of getting the charter. I think technology is great. I mean, you know, this is, you know, the United States, it's a place where technology is coming to the forefront all the time. I, I mean, it's exciting. I don't understand any of it, but I'm excited. <laughs> Please. Thomas Sutnus, a proud alumni of uh, UC Davis GSM program. Um, thank you for a very interesting discussion. I wanted to ask you about the question about the Citigroup and, and banking industry in general. And we've seen lately that Citigroup include, and, and other banks were um, had some controversy in terms of leadership as well as they actively uh, were getting rid of so-called non-core assets or non-core businesses. And uh, you can call it, I, I guess you can call it a downsizing. Do you think that as these banks get stronger and uh, um, more profitable over time, do you think they will come back to the same business model they used to have and start acquiring other, other, industry, other um, assets in other industries such as brokerage, uh, private equity, et cetera, and that in, in a couple of years we'll end up in the same um, sit similar situation of what was prior to uh, financial crisis when the banks got involved mm -hmm. in too many different uh, businesses and business lines? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think I'd go back to what I said before, that <clears throat> if you have leverage restrictions and you have risk-weighted assets that are evaluated that are the other side of that equation and mark to market and everything has to be transparent, uh, I think you might see some, but I think it's going to be a long time before you see banks being able to buy other things. Uh, it is not in the psyche of the American public. It's not in the psyche of the regulators. So you could look at, for example, a company uh, like Citigroup today, and uh, they have a hundred and some odd year old franchises in Latin America and in Asia and in the Middle East that uh, if they can get their act together, will put them in terrific shape for the future because uh, nobody else is going to be able to buy those things. They're going to have to build them out. And if you build it out, it's over a long period of time. And uh, you know, it takes time to get into the hearts and minds of people in particular countries. And when you've been in a place 100 years and somebody's been there six months, you know, you're at a big advantage uh, in, in knowing the people, and people that worked in your place have been in the finance ministry. Some of them have become presidents of the country, and uh, so I, I don't think you're going to see anything like uh, what you're talking about in, in, you know, in the next lot of years. That's why I think, uh, you know, splitting up these things where it can happen. Um, may put us in a better position. And as long as they can't leverage themselves to, to uh, I think that it's an American right to go broke. Uh, so if uh, people want to be stupid and go broke and they don't hurt everybody else, God bless them. Uh, you know, that's the problem. The big problem with the banks the last time is for whatever reason, all the bondholders were bailed out 100% and the shareholders went down the tubes. Yeah. I mean, that's not right. The bondholders shouldn't be bailed out. And if the bondholders wouldn't have been bailed out, then the government wouldn't have had to put so much money in, and then the government wouldn't have made as much money as they ended up making. <laughs> Shall we have one more uh, question for <coughs> Sandy? Or? There's, okay. Thank you. Uh, Jim Harney, you met earlier. But uh, first Jim, off, I'd like to thank. Jim Harney what? Jim Harney, uh, I'm a current student, oh. um, and before before I ask my question, I'd like to thank you for coming in earlier to speak to students in a smaller group because that really makes a difference to uh, me and I know to other students to have that sort of more informal connection and uh, that conversation that um, gives uh, insight in a less formal setting. Thank you. Um, I liked it too. Well. Anytime you'd like to come by. <laughs> um, you stop by. <laughs> yeah. what, what kind of wine do you have? <laughs> we got well, loads we can, of wine. We no can, problem. Wine is something we can sort out. 
we've got people we can talk to. Um, <laughs> but I, li I like the idea that you're, you're suggesting of, of finding a way to, to wind down the zero interest rate. But I'm, the difficult thing for me is figuring out how we can do that with our current situation where a lot of other countries are holding massive foreign currency reserves that are U.S. and where we have our, our position as the foreign reserve currency that gives us an advantage in the banking industry and allows us to do all of this investment overseas. Mm -hmm. But if we move from a position where we have really low interest rates, how are we going to maintain mm -hmm. that competitive advantage while <laughs> we... Uh, okay. Well, we were paying these people 6%. The absolute low interest rates is artificial. It's being caused by the Fed buying back all the paper that they're selling. Uh, if we continue to do that for, I don't know at what period it happens, but eventually uh, some of these countries that own our debt, and we're different than Japan because in Japan the debt is all owned internally, the United States, the great percentage of it is owned externally, um, and they decide not to buy our debt, what's going to happen to our interest rates? We're going to more than make up this thing of zero sometime else. And then what is that going to do to the pensioners that have bought five-year bonds or 10-year bonds or 20-year or bonds with... 10-year uh, bonds with a 2% interest rate or 20-year or bonds with a 3% interest rate, and those rates go to 6 or 7 or 8, what happens to their principal? You know, it, it's, you know, really, we're taking a big risk with, uh, with the, the people that we're forcing to go and do things because they need the income to live. So we put that on the page. It's just the one page, yeah. though. Yeah, it's only the one page. <laughs> well, uh, Sandy, Joan, and Ann, we want to thank you for an absolutely riveting conversation tonight about very important issues. So please join me in thanking them. Thank you. Sandy, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not, we're not quite, not quite done. <laughs> And, and I'm, I'm fascinated with this prospect of the one-pager by Sandy and Ann. Uh, <laughs> I'm serious, we'll and it will be a duet. We'll come back and sing. Yeah? Okay, all right. That will definitely make news. Not in San Quentin, though. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best to stay out of jail. Yes, I agree. <laughs> so, Sandy and, and Joan, uh, we want to uh, give you a small uh, gift uh, for, uh, to signify our appreciation for coming to, to join us uh, here in the, at, on the UC Davis campus today. And uh, you may not be aware, but this is Sacramento Beer Week. Uh, I'm sure that Tommy knows that. So, uh, <laughs> but so in the spirit of this annual celebration, we'd like to present you with handcrafted Roostaller Ale. So this comes courtesy of one of our very successful entrepreneurial MBA graduates from the Graduate School of Management, J.E. Pano, who brews Roostaller Ale with locally grown hops and barley. So enjoy. Oh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>